and we'll read from verse 16 um, to the end. Verses 16 to 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through to 21. One for us to read together. So I'm, I'm waiting to see it on the screen um, projected um, for us. We want to read um, those verses together. I want everybody to participate in the reading of God's word. Second Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 16. All right, it appears, okay, here we go from the New International Version. Um, let's read together, please. Let's read. From now, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is heir. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sin against them, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though we were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Final verse. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God in him. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless your word to our hearts. And that you will glorify yourself in all our lives. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. You know, two weeks' time, we're going to be married, my wife and myself, we're going to be married 39 years. And there are some things that I just love doing, and there are some things I do, but I really don't enjoy doing. I mean, I can help myself more than help myself. Um, in the kitchen, but I don't like to be in the kitchen, you know, preparing to cook and cooking. All right? <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> oh, oh, somebody was indicating <laughs> that, 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 that that's the same for him. All right, yes, Brother Calvin, I didn't realize that. Sorry about that. All right? Now, one thing I enjoy doing is doing the shopping for the food. So I don't like to cook the food. But in my home, I do most of the grocery shopping. Most of it. And one of the things, I mean, my kids, I mean, they no longer accompany me. When they're no longer, you can't, they are still our children. Still can call them kids. In, now in their 30s, grown men. But in the early days when they used to come to the supermarket and say, Daddy, again? Because after going through the cashier, paying for my goods, I will find a little spot in the supermarket and I will go through my receipt just to ensure that what I just paid for is what I saw displayed 
on the items on the shelf. And from time to time, especially when I have the time, I will dis go to the customer service counter and I will dispute and say, I didn't see this orange juice for this price. And you charge me this price. And they will go through the ropes of reimbursing me. And there are all these persons on the outside, you know, um, begging. And usually as a practice, I will give them. Sometimes it's all three, and you, you need to do it as a practice. All $300, $400 sometimes. They are overcharging you based on what is displayed with the item, listed price of the item, and when you compare with your receipt, you're paying all three, four hundred dollars more. It has happened to me, and I'm pretty sure it has happened to you, but maybe you're not, you're not like me, all right? Um, you have a lot of money, <laughs> so you don't need bang for your buck. But that's something I do even to this day. Even to this day, Mrs. Society and myself, sometimes we go to the supermarket together and it's a habit of hers now to just find the spot and I know that that is the spot that I should go. <laughs> and do my checks. All right? Because we want bang for our bucks. It's a fair exchange. And what I pay for, that's what I want to receive a fair exchange. That's what we want to talk about very briefly today. We want to talk about the great exchange. No, I didn't coin that phrase. It was coined by Martin Luther, the great reformer in the 15th century. And we say a little bit more um, about it um, later on. But what do we bring to the transaction? What do we bring to the table? When you think about trade, we bring uncleanness, sin, and unrighteousness. And when we leave that transaction, we leave with the righteousness of the Lord Jesus. We leave with that which we weren't born with. And it's no wonder that as Martin Luther looked at Romans and as he looked at Galatians, that he calls it the great exchange where Jesus, the Lord Jesus, he who knew no sin, became sin for us, took on our sin. And then he gave us his righteousness, his righteousness, the great exchange. And I want to put it to you today that if you don't know him, you're still on the debit side. If you don't know him, you are running a deficit like Jamaica. We import so, so much more than we export. We borrow so much over the years than we are able to pay back. We are always running a deficit. And I want to put it to us today that as human beings, we are all, we all share a grave experience. That's the first point. We share a grave experience. The psalmist in Psalm 51 says, I was born in sin and shapen in iniquity. In sin, did my mom conceive me? Every single one of us born on planet earth have as our federal head Adam and Paul says it in Romans chapter 5 
as in Adam, all died. And so death passed upon all man, all woman, all boy and girl, for that all have died. And the Bible tells us, from the dawn of creation, the instruction, the command was, the day that you eat of the tree in the midst of the garden, you shall surely die. No, no, no but about it. The soul that sin it shall surely die. The scripture tells us the wages of sin is death. Don't worry. God is not like two policemen that I had experience with some time ago. And we have some police officers here. And I will confess, I was driving over the speed limit, heading back into town. Not even, can't even recall where I was coming from. Out by Central Village, White Marl there. And right under that big, big tree there in front of Lasco. I was caught. I was, and I was guilty. Yes. And I took out my license. And the officer showed me what the radar showed me going in a 50, 50 kilometer zone. And he, he, he took out his book. And he, as he was about to write, his, 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 his colleague had the radio. And he turned it up as a call came in. And I, I mean, I couldn't hear but I hear it. The, the, the officer said to the one who was about to write me up, he said, I mean, we have to leave here. Give back, give, give back the gentleman his thing, his, his, his papers. Of course, you know who wasn't complaining. <laughs> My license fell on the ground. He apologized and they ran to their vehicle. A call came in for another operation that was going on somewhere else that was much more important than writing a ticket for a speeding motorist. And I was let off the oak that day. I have, I have not, never forgotten it. Didn't have to pay a fine. I got away. <laughs> but when it comes to divine business, as the, as the brother sang earlier, about going to heaven and crying out holy to the Lamb of God. God is complete perfection and holiness. One writer says, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 1 John 1 and verse 5. And God will not compromise his standards for you or for me. And so that's why as human beings we were facing a grave experience. All of us. Doesn't matter which family we were born into. Which community we live who we know, the tone of our skin color, the size of our bank account, the political party we are affiliated with, all of us have this grave experience. And we have a dilemma because we couldn't help ourselves. The prophet Isaiah says, all our righteousness, in Isaiah 64, verse 9, were like filthy rags. And you may say this is offensive, but that literally means to God, all our righteousness, all our efforts to please him are like a woman's menstrual pad or cloth. It's obnoxious in his sight. 
as good as we think we are, we fall short. We fell short. Yes. In athletics, the aim is to reach the tape first. But in God's Olympics, all of us miss the mark. That's what sin means. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's a missing of the mark. So we have a dilemma. But I'm happy that the story doesn't end there. I'm happy that the scriptures, we just read it, that God did not treat us as our sin deserved. It's an allusion to, to Psalm 103. He has not treated us according to our sins. The Apostle Paul is here saying, is in verse 19, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting our trespasses, our guilt, our sin against us. What God did was put them on his son. He credited them to his son. The word that theologians use for this is imputation. Imputation. And all that means is to credit to one's account. You remember what I said at the beginning? We were running a deficit. We couldn't help ourselves. We, everything we had was in the debit column. We had everything going against us. Adam's sin was imputed to us. It was credited to us. But Adam's sin was credited to the Lord Jesus. All our sins were credited to him, were laid on him. When the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross, he wasn't dying for his sins. He was dying for us. This is what the prophet Isaiah says in the suffering servant prophecy. Isaiah 53 and verse 4, he says, He himself bore our sins. And I want you to notice how many times the pronoun, the plural pronoun comes out in this text because it is our sins and he carried our pain. But we in turn struck, guarded him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced because of what? Our rebellion. Crushed because of our iniquities. Punishment for our peace. Our peace was on him. And we are healed by his wounds. We all went astray. Like sheep, we all have turned to our own way. But the Lord has punished him for the iniquity of us all. It is our sins. It is our punishment. It is our death. It is our destruction. But on the cross, they were laid on him. It's no wonder Martin Luther calls that the great exchange. Where God looks at you, looks at me, sinners. And he can now declare us righteous. That's what another word um, Bible scholars use is justification. That word was used by our brother Jasper Scott this morning in our breaking of bread service. And of course, the layman's interpretation of that is that God looks at me just as if I have never sinned. Just as if I have never sinned. When I stand in Jesus, 
I stand accepted by God just as if I've never committed sin. How much sins do you commit per day? How old are you since the age of accountability? Since you reached the knowledge of sin, how many sins have you committed per day? Say two or three. How many days in the year? Multiply that. And remember, we are dealing with conservative figures here. And it will tell you the magnitude of the work that the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross for you and for me. To be declared innocent. You know, we have a sister at Carmel. Hard working. Servants art sister, Sister Felicia. Left her there just a while ago. Up and about making sure that the, the toilets are okay, that toilet paper and soap and all of that. It's not her direct responsibility, you know, but she's just always doing it. But before this, Sister Venetia used to juggle drugs. She used to go to St. Thomas and she used to buy drugs in bulk, ganja, and travel over on the bus. And one day, pull up the bus. I'm not picking this, uh, uh, the officers today. But they stop the bus, and they search everybody, and they found her stash. And she was arrested. She was given station bail. She went to court. She, was, she pleaded guilty. And she ended up with a record. And I remember one day being at church, Carmel, with Sister Venetia. We are doing some work there. And I hear Venetia ball out, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! And we just couldn't understand why Venetia was just out of the blue. And she explained to us, they called her from the court's office and they tell her, that her records have been expunged. She was given the news that that record that she has as a criminal have been removed. She has been pardoned. It has been wiped. Her slate has been wiped clean. The Lord Jesus did that for me in 1980. On my bed in the inner city community of Rockford where I born. And I grew up. Where I harbored resentment against my parents for leaving me with my grandmother. As a teenager. We had feelings growing up. Insecurity. Some here, six, five almost, six, four and a half exactly. Size 14. At 13, I was wearing 13. Yes. And I'm happy, you know, at 65, I'm wearing 14. It wasn't a linear relationship. <laughs> And as you seek acceptance, camper down where I went for high school, I got the nickname LBW when I tried out for cricket. I know in cricket it's L before, leg before wicket. But they were calling me long, big, and worthless because I was awkward and clumsy. And three years after leaving Camperdown, I had my encounter with Jesus. With Jesus. And that same brother who I left at Carmel, Brother Jasper Scott, he never called me long, big, and worthless. You know what he called me when I went to Carmel and started to play volleyball and play very well too? Tall star. Tall star, man. 
Jesus can turn you from being long, big, and worthless into tall star, into a star. And all I brought to the table was my sin, my shame, my insecurity. And when I left, and it's not like I left, you know, because he's still with me. I have his righteousness. So from a grave experience to a great exchange. And finally, what I call a gracious engagement. Because can you imagine? In Psalm 139, the psalmist says, you, praying to God says, you know my thoughts are far off. You know what I mean? That God is already in the future knowing what you and I are thinking, are going to think, what we are going to be doing. And, and the psalmist says, oh, where shall I go from your presence? I take the wings of the morning and I go far, far, far. Behold, you are there. The psalmist says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. In verse 14, the psalmist says, I am fearfully and wonderfully mean. We come from monkey evolution. Every design requires a designer. This little watch on my hand didn't just happen. The parts weren't placed in a room and it shake up over time and they join together. Someone thought about it. And someone designed it. And someone manufactured it. And the same is true of creation. The same is true of us. Our God is all powerful. He is all knowing. He is everywhere present. I'd love to be at Carmel this morning. Because Uncle Jasper, Aunt Dell, their daughter, another um, Carmelite that we grew up with from the community, all of them are there from the States. One of them is only one we knew was coming. And it pained us to leave them. But guess what? I am limited. Yes, I have a commitment. And I can't be two place at the same time. I, we are limited by time and space, but God has no such limitation. And look at what? Look at all of that. God could do his work himself. But he so designed his work that he engaged us. He engaged us. He engaged us who, who failed him. He engage us who are unreliable and often don't live up to our responsibility. But still, it's a gracious engagement to be ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. To take the message of reconciliation. I'm sure, we are, we are grateful for the work of our security forces of our police officers, some of whom are here. But we know that what Jamaica really, really needs is a message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And my brothers and my sisters, you and I have been entrusted with that responsibility graciously by our God who could do it himself. Paul says, we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. And that's our plea. We're pleading to you this morning. 
You are here, you are online. If you have never trusted the Lord Jesus, we plead that you'll be reconciled to God. Realizing that though Adam's sin was imputed to us, credited to our account, our sin was in turn credited to the account of the Lord Jesus. And while he was there on the cross, he shouted, Tetelestai, meaning, it is finished. You ever go somewhere and you know what layaway is, right? Yeah, man, um, the goods cost $1,000. You don't have $1,000. So you pay $50. Then you pay another $100. And when you reach $950, you walk into the place and you give them that final $50. They give you the receipt and they stamp it and they give you the goods paid in full. That's what Jesus did on the cross. And now his righteousness, his goodness is credited to us. To us. Oh, what a salvation. No wonder Martin Luther says it's a great exchange. So as we close, I encourage you, if you have never trusted the Lord Jesus, that you do so before it is forever too late. For time is running out. The two songs the brother sang this morning are about the midnight cry, about going home to heaven. There is a time coming when this offer will be off the table. And he who stands now as savior will be judge. And what he would say on that day is depart from me. I never knew you. My brothers and my sisters, we have the tremendous responsibility. We have been entrusted with a tremendous responsibility, the message of reconciliation through the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Oh, may we be faithful. That's what Paul says. It's required of stewards to be found faithful. Faithful. For his name's sake. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. And we want for you to talk to the Lord concerning your particular need. For a child of God, you know your standing regarding your responsibility with this gracious engagement. How effective have you been as an ambassador? How, more, how, are you, how effectively are you representing heaven here on earth? And if you have never trusted the Lord Jesus, we want for you to bow to his claim so that he can shout like our sister Venetia. Hallelujah! Praise the Lord. Let God declare you justified, righteous. You talk to God right where you are.